Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our first book, Coffee and Books event at Palestine Rights. It's a, it's a privilege to be able to have a conversation today with Dr. Gada Karmi. We'll be talking about her book, uh, Return, a fabulous memoir, which I'm going to show you here before we start our conversation. I hope you'll be able to see it. Um, and we'll be probably speaking about some of her other works along the way. Um, thank you for coming to Palestine Rights. Um, my name is Bill Mullen. I'm one of the festival co-organizers. Um, Dr. Gada Karmi is a leading Palestinian academic, activist, and writer. She was born in Jerusalem and was educated in England, where she was first trained as a doctor of medicine. She went on to become an academic at the Institute of Arabic and Islamic Studies, the University, University of Exeter. Uh, her major area of research has centered on the Palestine-Israel conflict, which she taught until 2012. She has also worked on issues of migration and adjustments of minorities to Western culture and carried out three major studies of the Punjabi, Moroccan, and Egyptian communities in London. Just to say a little bit about format, um, I have, Gada and I have discussed some questions that I'm going to share with her. As we're conversing, feel free to put, if you'd like questions in either English or Arabic in the chat. Um, we will be doing our best to translate questions that need to be translated. Um, if you have a globe at the bottom of your screen you, and you click on it, you should also have the option of choosing English or Arabic uh, interpretation of today's discussion. So please take advantage of that if you would like. So we'll, let, we'll go ahead and jump into our, our conversation. And it's just so lovely to have you here. God, thank you for being part of the festival. And th thank you for having me. Um, Return is such a fabulous book. Um, it is I, your second book, I think, that can be classified as a memoir, the first being a book that I'm sure many other people have also read called In Search of Fatima. And I was interested to know how the two books kind of compare for you and, and why you decided to write Return after already writing a memoir uh, uh, before. So uh, I welcome your thoughts on that. Well, well, to tell you the truth, um, some people weren't particularly encouraging when I uh, decided to write the second memoir. Um, one or two said to me, um, in search of Fatima said it all, uh, what on earth uh, more do you have to add to what you've said in that memoir? Um, and and I, I could only, I mean, I could only respond if I had wanted to, to them by saying that, first of all, the story is not over for the Palestinians, and sadly, alas, it's not over. Secondly, for me personally, when I went back to um, Palestine in uh, 2005, um, you know, it it uh, it it was it was a, quite an experience. Um, it, it's one thing to write about a memoir about childhood and adjustment in the past, but it's something else to write about something which feels extremely immediate. It's still here. It's still the same, and I was compelled to write it. That's all I can say. Um. The, the book centers on return, for those who haven't read it, uh, centers on your work experience for the Palestinian Authority with the Ministry of Media and Communications. And you're really candid uh, in the book about some of the frustrations of the work that you did while you were there. For those who haven't read the book, can you talk a little bit about that, that aspect and that experience? Yes, I, I uh, look, before I went to, before I decided to go to uh, what remains of Palestine, um, I felt that I had to stop what I would call this kind of armchair commentary on Palestine, because when you're in exile, as I am, <coughs> that applies to many Palestinians, of course, um, and for one reason or another, one hasn't been, one hasn't actually, one is not living there, one hasn't lived there uh, for a very long time, um, you begin 
I think, to sound a bit unreal. You begin to imagine that you really know what's going on um, when you don't. You, you don't have that intimate feeling, that first-hand feeling of actually being there, of interacting with people. Anyway, I, I had come to that conclusion. I'd been a commentator and writer about, about Palestine for many years by then, uh, and an activist for the Palestinian cause. Um, and I felt a phony, frankly. And I remember I used to feel jealous when um, either non-Arabs, non-Jews or Jews who'd been out to uh, uh, Palestine and, and lived there and worked there, came back talking about their experiences, I'd feel I was not authentic um, and I was jealous. <clears throat> so I thought, no, this has to end and I must go, I must go. And the best way I could think of going there was to get right into the heart of it. You know, I could have gone as a researcher of some kind. I could have gone out uh, as a, at Birzeit University, let's say, and, and, and carried out some kind of survey, but I didn't want that. I wanted to be a worker, one of the people, um, and obviously the Palestinian Authority was the address. Uh, there was a UN program at the time, a UNDP program to be precise, which encouraged um, Palestinians in exile to come and uh, attach themselves to one of the ministries of the Palestinian Authority uh, and, and act as an advisor, uh, um, you know, the consultant, that sort of thing. So that's what I um, decided to do. The, um, the book offers really remarkable observations on conditions for Palestinians um, living in Gaza, uh, in refugee camps, uh, in the West Bank as you move, uh, while also recognizing throughout the book, the real dignity uh, with which people struggle to live and, and, and work and make their lives. And I just wondered for you, if there's a single story from the book that best illuminates some of the complexities of the experience of Palestinians that you, that you witnessed when you were there. Yeah, well, I suppose there are several of these, but um, let me just talk about, first of all, about Hebron. <clears throat> now, I was extremely um, distressed by what I saw in Hebron. Um, I went there with a British journalist and a human rights worker, or Italian, and um, uh, we, we went there and uh, saw in one day, different sides of what life is like for people in the Israeli occupied part of Hebron. Uh, by that, I mean where the settlements are, you know. Um, and so, what can I say? We started off by visiting a Palestinian farmer uh, who, whose land was threatened constantly. By, the, by Israeli settlers, backed by the Israeli army, uh, and whose water had been cut off by the time that I met him. Uh, now this, uh, the, the farm consisted mainly of, of, of vineyards. Uh, Hebron is very well known for its grapes, but, they were, but, but these grapes were withering on the vine because there was no water and he was, so agonized about this. He was an elderly man who I really feared for his life. I thought he'd just die of a heart attack, of fury, of a stroke, because he was so angry about what had been done to his farm. He had resorted to, well, the, the water, Israel's water, the national water carrier had uh, um, bypassed his, fa uh, his farm. So he didn't have any water, but he had a well and then one day the Israeli army came and um, uh, filled that up with stones. So he couldn't actually use it. And it was at that point that I met him. That was terrible, uh, so tragic. And then from there, in going into Hebron, I, I passed by the Ibrahimi Mosque, wonderful uh, Islamic monument. Um, and, you know, <laughs> It was so abused. This building, this beautiful historical building 
had not been left alone by these dreadful people, they had, um, they had introduced a synagogue of all things into one half of it, the half they decided was to be for them, that's the Israeli half, um, which has the tombs of the patriarchs, so-called. And what is ludicrous about this, I mean, was that when I visited, um, uh, being admitted as a foreigner, not because, of course, I'm Palestinian, but I mean, I, I went in with, the, um, uh, you know, these two foreigners, so they assumed I was a foreigner, and that was fine. But anyway, when we went there, I, can, I cannot describe to you, these are Islamic shrines. Anybody can see they are. The shape, they're draped by uh, uh, beautiful cloth with Quranic verses all over it, Arabic. What the hell has that got to do with Israel? You know, and, and they've taken it over. And they, you know, you could see that they, they were lost in some kind of fantasy, I, you know, where they thought they were seeing Abraham or, or whatever. But, and that was dreadful. And then, of course, it got worse and worse. We then went into the souk, the old souk. Um, in which um, the, 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 the poor, poor stallholders, the tradesmen were desperate. There was no business, nobody goes there, the army is everywhere. It was just atrocious how on earth they could go on living in such a circumstance. I, I, I don't know. I would have died of fury long before had I mm. been then. And that oh. was that was really memorable, um, mm. and I just want to add quickly that when I came back to Ramallah, I was so shocked that evening. I remember I, there was a dinner at which I'd been invited, and there were various of these um, Palestinian middle class middle class Palestinians who worked for NGOs, big business in 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 the West Bank, and uh, I got I was so traumatized by this I couldn't help talking about it. They all looked at me in, you know, as if I was at fallen out of Mars. Uh, that as I was talking about something which they were not interested in, that was obvious, mm -hmm. and they didn't really um, bother about. And uh, they said, oh, well, you know, we know all about that. And I could have sworn, I'd, I'd, I'd love to have asked them, when was the last time any of them had ever actually been to Hebron? And in thereby, you see, this illustrates another tragic side effect of what this Israel has done. It's separate, it's, it's made, it's created layers and classes between Palestinians. So some of these uh, young people, they were young and who were working for NGO, foreign NGOs, I think weren't seeing themselves in, in the reality of their real position, or that's how it seemed to me. And that was really very unpleasant. Mm. Um. Yeah, I thought that section of the book was incredibly powerful. Um, and of course, I should, Bill, sh sorry, I should say, of course, Gaza was a whole different scene. Yeah. That was the thing, you know, I had to get used to, that right. because of the, the way that Israel has created barriers between villages and villages, towns and towns, poor old Gaza is cut off completely. So when you go there, you not only feel what a garrison place it is, uh, um, but but people there are, are behave differently. They have they have, their lives are infinitely worse for a start, and um, it's all it's, it's it has a very special atmosphere. Gaza very special. You uh, about three quarters of the way through the book, you write a chapter called motherhood. And you talk about raising your daughter, Salma. And I thought it was a beautiful part of the book. And I was curious about why you located it there kind of towards the end of the narrative, or if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that element of the book, because it's a, it's kind of a powerful uh, detour from, from the main narrative. Well, you know, by the way, um, a lot of people were taken aback by, by, by this, chapter, which is very, very frank, um, very, very revealing. Um, and I myself, you know, after I were, after it was published, I started to think, should I have actually talked about this? Um, mm -hmm. But but really, you know, first of all, the, why, why write it at all? Well, I wanted to convey a picture of myself. It's not just 
uh, me as an observer of the Palestine of 2005, but the, who is me, you know? And, and, and the me uh, was somebody who had had uh, the, a, a particular kind of life and who was unlucky, frankly, in many things. I was unlucky in being thrown out of my country when I was a child. I was unlucky in being Palestinian in a Western country where Palestine was non-admissible for a very long time. Nobody talked about it. Um, and I was unlucky in love, sadly. Um, and I felt really I, I ought to, uh, to to say something about that. It's very personal. Um, and of course, it's towards the end because really it's chronological because I mean, when I, 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 I sort of, uh, well, I, I, in the way that I constructed the narrative, um, the events it had a kind of a logical connection. One thing led to the other, led to the other. And then I thought at that point, I paused and I said, right, the reader knows to know, needs to know who the hell I am, really. And so I, I added it. And um, I'm not sure, really, even now, <laughs> whether I should have done so. I love that. I love that part of the book. <laughs> um, perhaps because I'm a parent, but also it opened up another dimension of you for, uh, for me as a reader, which I really, really loved. There's another really intimate part of the book regarding family. You, you open and close the book with visits to your father who passes away in, uh, towards at the conclusion of the book. And um, you identify strongly with him because he was the head of your family that was displaced during the Nakba. And you say, and I'm quoting, by rights, he and all Palestinians should have been rewarded for their patience with the ending of the conflict, the life of normality and the restitution of what had been lost. I wondered if you could say a bit more about similarities and differences um, of experience for your parents' generation and your generation after the Nakba. Yeah, I mean, my parents, um, they really bore the brunt of it, you know, because I mean, for years I, I um, resented them. I thought that they had failed in so many different ways. It took me years to understand that the trauma they had experienced um, because of the because of the establishment of the state of Israel was so profound. It, it, it amazes me that they were ever ever able to pick themselves up and bring us up and and have a, a kind of a, a normal life. Um, mm. And I do talk about that, yes, in the book because it's extremely important. Not not so much in terms of me, myself, and this particular family, but because it's a very common experience uh, along that, uh, all over that generation of Palestinians. Uh, you know, the Nakba uh, is not, even now, is not fully understood by Palestinians themselves. Uh, I'm not talking about the historical events at all, or the legalities or the politics, I don't mean that. But I mean that the Nakba was intensely traumatic at so many levels that many Palestinians, if not most, still don't fully understand it, still haven't fully digested it. Uh, the, the, the dislocation that occurred, the, and, and what was worse, the delegitimization of the experience carried on by the Zionists you know, it's bad enough that we were thrown out. They took took our our place, but we it it wasn't um, valid to 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 be, to be upset about it. You know, because these people had some kind of prior right. This thing used to drive me insane, and you know, it very much brings me to just a little short extract I wanted to read from the book. Yes, Is that please. all right? Of course, please. You see, I I for all my life. Uh, I'd, I'd never, never, ever lost sight of this dreadful injustice and the trauma that had been inflicted by Palestine, uh, by, 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 by what had happened to Palestine. But after I, I my experiences in 2005, and I began to see a new reality, a new reality that wasn't mine. I, I had carried a 
picture of Palestine, which was like a frozen historical tableau. It no longer existed. The Palestine I was seeing in 2005, the people who were in it were struggling on the ground as best they could against the occupiers, against the Israeli army. Um, and for the first time in my life, I began to be afraid that our return to our homeland might not happen. Now, I never ever, uh, ever would have thought that because the issue was at the heart of it, you know, returning, regaining what had been lost. So in this extract, um, I say here, for me, return was at the heart of the issue. Without it, the injustice that had blighted our lives for generations would never cease. One day, when my sister and I had been discussing our fragmented family and how dispersed we were, how no one lived close to the other, each alone in the world, and how unnatural it all, were, it all was, she said bitterly, if we had never left our country, none of this would ever have happened. We would have been amongst our kin, growing up together, helping each other, none of us living or dying alone. And looking up to heaven, she raised her hands, palms upward in supplication and exclaimed with quiet vehemence, I pray to almighty God that he may wreck their lives as they have wrecked ours. Mm. Anybody who knows Arabic will know what she actually said, that's really, it's a translation of that. And, um, you know, this was, I'd never ever thought that, that this, the injustice could be allowed to, to, to pass, really. And I still, I still, I've come back to my previous view. No, it won't be allowed to pass because I tell you, one of the things that has so uplifted me and cheered me is the sight of the young generation of people, like the generation of my daughter and, and, and even younger, uh, living in the West, exiled, and as devoted, if not more, to the cause of Palestine than we were. It's wonderful. And that's how uh, return will eventually happen, I think. That's a fabulous response. I'm, I'm going to, we have a question that's come into the Q&A from Sarah Zahid. I'm going to read it. Thank you, Bill and Gada, for this wonderful conversation. I was wondering if anyone can clarify on this issue. Uh, Gada, you spoke of the beautiful Islamic shrines that have been, are taken over by the Israeli government. You rightly point out these are Islamic spiritual sites that have nothing to do with Israel. But how do we argue back with scholars who claim that Judaism existed before Islam Hence, these shrines were built upon the Jewish communities that had existed years ago prior to the existence of the Palestinian communities. How do we combat the theological claim to the land that Israel has historically reimagined to be theirs, hence the return of the Israel on the land of Palestine? Do, do you care to answer that? Yeah, uh, it's not too hard to answer that. <laughs> First of all, Judaism precedes Islam. Of course, it precedes Christianity. There's no question about that. That is a, a, a um, that the fact that, that, that in, in chronology, Judaism um, preceded Islam doesn't have any bearing on the fact that the shrines we, I, I was talking about that I saw were built by Muslims because the so-called patriarchs are uh, sacred to Islam also. Abraham, Ibrahim in Arabic, is considered to be the first Muslim, quote unquote. Uh, he features in the Quran, uh, Isaac, Ishaq, um, Ismail, all of it, other than their wives, the, 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 these are prophets. So, so this is a heritage. It's not, doesn't belong there or, or, or elsewhere. It, it, it belongs to the people who, who are believers, who believe in it, and it's part of their religious belief. That's the, the next point. And the, and, and the third point, which should 
really be the clincher is that you, first of all, you don't go and take over a monument which other people belonging to another religion have built in honor of their prophets and say to them, ah, but those prophets were ours before and therefore it's nothing to do with you and we're gonna take it over. So you don't do that. <laughs> and, and you particularly don't do that when you are the, uh, um, the people who have, do not come from Palestine, but come from Eastern Europe. And your patrimony is sitting in Poland, Lithuania, and Russia. It's not sitting in my country or in the city of Hebron. Fabulous. Um, again, if you have a question and you'd like to put in the Q&A, please feel free. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask uh, got a question about the ending of the book, which is really powerful and very bittersweet as I read it. Um, you finish your work, and you leave Ramallah to come back to London, and you're a bit, I guess, dismayed about some of what you've seen, or the unresolved conflicts, problems, conditions, and you write, and I'm quoting, how I wished at the time I could have seen a ray of light or a chink of hope in the bleakness for the Palestinian plight, the promise of a new beginning, rather than a certainty of an end. And you talked a little bit earlier about that feeling. Um, how do you, you how do you reconcile some of those feelings after writing the book? Does writing the book help put those feelings in perspective? Is it cathartic? How does it make you kind of reflect on these difficult questions of unsolved problems? Yeah, I mean, certainly writing the book uh, helped me a lot. I was able to uh, collect my thoughts and 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 sort out my the impressions that I had. Uh, and the very the, the many vivid pictures that I retain, uh, I was able to sort of classify them and sort them out and edit them, if you like, in a way. And that's very helpful. But in terms of the gloom and the despondency that I felt when I went back to, to London, there's no doubt that I, I felt it. And I still feel it, uh, um, not all the time, but I still feel it from time to time because the reality is so disheartening. It's so disheartening. And you always have to keep reminding yourself um, that, that history doesn't work like that. You, 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 you have events that happen, they create a reaction. And you cannot judge where that reaction will lead when you're sitting at one particular point in history. So by that I mean, um, Israel was created in an extremely brutal, unjust, and totally unacceptable way. Um, that event had a, a reaction. There was a reaction to it. The people who were uh, had to pay the price, uh, etc. Now, that set a historical process. Uh, um, in it, it, it set it going. It's not something that occurred. And there you are, it's happened, and that's the end of the story. It's not. Because uh, like a, I don't know, a pebble that you throw into a lake or into a pond, the, the ripples it creates go on and on, and you don't quite know where they lead. Um, but there's no doubt that I uh, don't always, I can't always sit back and, and, and look at this with this ph philosophical attitude it, it frankly, it infuriates me. It infuriates, drives me mad that that um, that Israel, which has done all this damage, and it is still, as I was saying earlier, still not completely calculated yet the amount, the extent of the damage it's done to a people who've done them no harm, who are completely innocent. Um, the extent of that damage is uh, um, such that. No, no body of people, no state, no uh, organization should be allowed to do that and get away with it. Because, mm. you know, that's the heart of it. That's why so many Palestinians um, are angry. It's bad enough what Israel did, but, but to be unaccountable to never having to pay for what you did never mm. being sanctioned or punished is, mm. is too much. It's really a step too far. Mm. 
There are some fabulous questions coming into the q and I'm going to read them as they come in in order. Uh, Rima asks, uh, Gada, could you comment on the current politics and activism in the UK around Palestine? Well, the, uh, I'll try and be brief. Um, the activism uh, uh, for Palestine in the United Kingdom has a good history. Um, you know, from, from early on, from the late 60s, um, Palestinians and, and, and very importantly, non-Palestinians who are totally in solidarity and in sympathy with the Palestinians have worked very hard. It's been a long and good activist uh, tradition. So much so that you need to know that the, uh, uh, the government of Israel uh, was so alarmed by the situation in Britain that they took steps and they created a, a, um, a Ministry of Strategic Affairs, which, which actually tries to think of ways of fighting the boycott, divestment and sanctions um, uh, um, uh, campaign and, and sent out an ambassador called Mark Regev. This man is absolutely pernicious. He came to London with the express aim of busting this activism on, on behalf of Palestine. So it has, it has a very good history. However, I have to tell you that in very recent times, the Zionist lobby has become so powerful, not nearly as much as in, as in the United States, but it's going that way, has been so powerful, it's managed to start to chill and the Palestinian voice, to suppress the Palestinian voice, the situation at the moment is disheartening. Mm. Oh, thank you. E Essa writes, thank you so much for this amazing dialogue. You mentioned you, were in, you are encouraged by the younger generation in their activism and passion for Palestine. What attributes or behaviors do you find most encouraging and those that can continue to endure and eventually break through the occupation? Well, um, uh, by the way, a very quick thing about uh, your, the, the, the use of this term, the occupation. Uh, I no longer talk about the occupation because it encourages the idea that the problem started in 1967 with Israel's occupation, okay? And that if the occupation ended, all would be well. No, it isn't like that. The whole of Palestine has been occupied. Uh, in stages, first 1948, then 67. It's all part of the same project. So I think, uh, forgive me if I just give a little, little lecture, but we, we must not lose sight of the fact that the problem is Zionism and Zionism has operated right from the beginning. And so it's not a question of just the occupation, it's what Israel stands for, what it does, what it has been doing. Now, in terms of What's encouraging? Well, I'll tell you, it's very simple, really. You see, you've now got a generation of young people who were born in the West, they were educated in the West, and they know how to behave and conduct themselves and speak and write in a Western idiom. That's very important. And so culturally, uh, they're Western, politically and in their hearts, they're Palestinian. And that combination is a winner, I think. And we're beginning, you know, we're beginning to see it. Thank you. Lots of affirmation for your answer there in the chat. Aram asks, um, can, you, can we say that Israel's occupation is chiefly based on religion or does it seem to be a polemical viewpoint? If, what, are, what are some of the other reasons? What do you see as the basis of the, you've just said occupation is not the right word. Let's talk, maybe we could call it settler colonialism or Zionism. Absolutely. Uh, look, it's it's first of all the 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 real driving force behind the what is called the occupation, but was in fact the colonization of the rest of Palestine is political. It's it's not religious. It's political. It's to do with Zionism. Zionism set out to take over the whole country without its people. That putting it very simply, and so. So taking over um, the 1967 territories was the next step in the Zionist project, which is not about religion. However, the reason I think you asked the question is because 
um, what the Zionists did was to unleash, and that's the only term I can use, frankly, uh, a, a fanatical uh, religious Jews on uh, parts of the 1967 lands. Um, and these fanatics um, are believe that, that it belongs to the Jews, that the land belongs to the Jews, that it's an issue of what um, the Bible says, of what Moses was, uh, was given. You know, so I think that's where the religious tinge come into it, comes into it. And, and of course, um, the, the whole fight over the Aqsa Mosque, over the Islamic holy places by what appear to be religious Jews, but in fact, very much backed by the Israeli army uh, and backed by, by the Israeli government because these are places to be taken over. So I'm afraid it's a cynical, political, colonialist movement. And it can use, uses whatever is handy at the time to make itself appealing. Thank you. Um, next question is from Leila, who says, how can we support our young people who grow up without being aware of our past history and culture in schools and societies under occupation and exile? I spent 42 years, 12 of which doing programs in a weekend school, then talking and trying to organize uh, I'm distressed by, I think she's saying perhaps how little people, how uh, perhaps the, the younger generation understands it, but wants to understand. <clears throat> well, look, more of what you're saying, you have to educate. You've got to educate, but you have to accept also that human beings aren't all the same, that there will be a proportion of the younger generation, um, maybe more than one would like who want to be left alone to get on with their lives and want to imitate their peers in Western societies. It's fully understandable and one shouldn't really um, be very disappointed. I would, I would just tell you this, that I know of so many instances where the young people in question, uh, whom their parents were desperate to get them to be, uh, to understand the whole story and 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 where it all comes from and to be active etc we're just not interested for ages and ages and then they suddenly became interested they suddenly became active it's almost as if it's like a dormant thing that you talk about it you, you explain you, you tell the story and nothing happens but in a proportion that thing ferments inside the mind and comes out sooner or later. So I wouldn't despair. I really wouldn't. Going to have, we have about three minutes left, so I'm going to ask one final question, uh, and then I'll uh, take a minute to um, wrap up. Rania asks, uh, you'd, she'd like to know what you think about the future of Palestine. Uh, she says, you're a supporter of the one state solution. How will we resolve our struggle? Not a small question, but maybe you can, uh, you can have a okay. go at it. All right, let me try and be, <laughs> summarize as much as possible. <laughs> yes, indeed, I'm a supporter of the one state. Why? It's not because it's one state. Like we're not creating anything. It's the homeland and it belongs to us. We must be very clear about that. And we have to, we have to live in it. We have to go back to it and we have to make our lives there. How, the question only is how do we get there? That's, that's the aim and there can be no other aim. But so how do we get there? And, uh, and we get there by um, looking at what is available. What are the tools we can use to realize our aim of going home and being at home with the people who are already there? Now, in that I include, of course, the Jewish Israelis who are currently in the country. This is not something that we can, we can embark on the idea that you can you expel them and you, you know, start all over again. That's not what I'm talking about. We join them and we together, we make uh, uh, our lives uh, in a democratic way. Uh, how do we do that? Well, it's the subject of another lecture. Um, I could talk to you about my conclusion, which is that there is no quicker way to get there and no more successful way than for the people who already live under Israeli rule, and by that I, I mean 
the people who are living in the so-called occupied territories uh, who are currently being ruled by Israel without any kind of rights, they must demand equal rights. That's the first step on a journey which will finally lead us there. And that is something I fervently believe. Thank you so much. Slap, I'm seeing cheering in the chat. Um, uh, again, this is Return. I would really encourage you to buy it at our festival bookstore. Um, I would encourage you to come see Dr. Carmi speak again on Friday afternoon. She'll be on a session on memoir and biography, so we can continue some of this conversation, which needs to be continued. Um, a couple other things about the festival. If you really like the session and you want to talk about it more, we have a chat room called Afterwards. If you go to the lounge and click on it, you can meet people who might have been at the session and continue to exchange ideas about it. Um, I also want to remind people that we have a, a, a graffiti wall. If you go to the lounge and click on the Handala figure, you can write down thoughts about what's going on at the festival and let us know what you're thinking and what you're liking and what you'd like to see. Um, and last program note, uh, there's a lot happening for the rest of the day. About an hour from now, there's a fabulous poetry slam with a great lineup of writers. So if you're if you're a poet and a poetry fan, please try to uh, take advantage of that. I just want to end by saying to Dr. Carmi, what an honor it's been to speak with you. Fabulous remarks and a wonderful book. And I really hope that everybody here will have a chance to read it very soon. And thank you all for coming today and asking such brilliant questions. And thank you, uh, Bill, and thanks to everybody who has sent wonderful comments and, uh, very, and wonderful questions. I wish there had been more time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.